photography for me was always exciting because there's always something special to capture. There's a difference between seeing and looking and photography teaches you to really see life. I love sitting in your studio because oh, Christy, you just you. look around and um, everything is very magnetic. Oh. What do you see when you just look around your space? That is, that's a great question. You know, I see people that I've had the honor to meet and talk to and photograph. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a dream because I've met everyone I've ever dreamed of meeting. Yeah. And so when I look at Morgan Freeman or Aretha or Diana Ross and I mean, all people that you can call by their first names. No, <laughs> we don't really know. Exactly. Beyonce, but you're right. You're right. No, we know. They're known by just the first name. But, you know, and then the Oscar photos, you know, I, I yeah. photographed the Oscars for 32 years. And that was always so much fun. So, you know, I, it just, it's, it's just always fun to kind of look back and then and think about those experiences and always appreciate them. Yeah. Linda, tell me the first time you picked up a camera. The first time I picked up a camera, I was a child. I started when I was six. And it was a birthday gift from my parents. Mm -hmm. And was it I, one of those like little flat rectangle I ones? Because <laughs> I collect <laughs> vintage cameras, so I've got my vintage brownie. But yeah. you would know, it was, it was uh, you know, a brownie star flash. And I was the one in the family documenting everything. So I'm not in a lot of photo albums because I'm the one taking the photos yeah. and I always loved it and I always tell parents you know a camera is a much better investment than a toy because you never grow tired of it you continue to grow with it mm -hmm. and it was just something I loved but it was another gift that changed my life when I was 13 I will never forget opening this very elegant blue book with my name engraved in gold and it was a photo album and that was the gift that really changed my life because it showed my parents' respect for my photography. And it was a very elegant album, and it was something you really wouldn't see a 13-year-old, you know, having mm -hmm. on their, uh, you know, on their desk. But it was so special, and I still have it. So to me, it would be something that taking the pictures when you were younger, it was just what you were able to see. But that album then represented that others should see. Yes. And that it should be, yes. it's more than just your window into the world. Right. It's to be shared. Thank you. And it was just such a special gift. And I put, you know, photos in that were very special to me and they're still there. Mm -hmm. and like what? Well, of course, my family, mm -hmm. my dog, <laughs> <laughs> and Diana Ross and the Supremes. Do you believe my parents had taken us to the state fair and to the rooster tail to see the Supremes. Oh my gosh. So I have my photographs in that album of the Supremes. In fact, I have one over there too, I'll show you. But you know, the, these are photos taken when I think 11 or 12, but, but to be able to photograph the Supremes. So, right. you know, growing up in Detroit inspired me to pursue celebrity journalism because we could go to a record store and wait in line and meet the four tops. That's right. Or we could go to the state fair and see Aretha or the Supremes or to the Fox or the Rooster Tail. So we had those opportunities as kids and the tickets weren't expensive. <laughs> state <laughs> fair was free. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was having that access to the greatest Motown stars and, and then of course Aretha that really inspired me to continue to pursue my love of photographing stars. So when you said to your mom and dad, I mean, uh -huh. this was a no brainer then, that this was the path <laughs> yeah. that you were going to be able to take. What was it about that kind of celebrity photography though, that, that got you? Well, you know, my, I've always felt that I wanted to show the private side of someone really famous. So I've never used artificial light ever. Mm. And I always try to photograph someone in their own home with window light or outdoors so that it's real and natural. And you can look at the photograph and say, this is really the way this person is. It, there's mm -hmm. nothing changed about them. There isn't any Photoshop. There isn't anything done to alter someone. And I still don't. I still shoot the same way. I've mm -hmm. never changed. I'm the most non-technical person you ever want to meet. <laughs> you know, that's old what, school. I old am school. Very old school. But I just keep it simple. 
Yeah. You know, I spend maybe a half hour with you and I just have you, you know, comfortable in your own home where the lighting is natural and and then we're done. And it's so it's always simple um, and natural. I mean, that's very important to yeah. me to keep it natural. Yeah. So from taking pictures at the state fair yeah. <laughs> to what was then the first picture that you got paid for that you actually said, wait, this is going to, this is something. <laughs> well, you know, there, there were a few, <laughs> there was one that it's interesting. You know how in, a, in this business, sometimes something is newsworthy mm -hmm. and then it no longer is. But at that time, uh, one of the photographs that changed my career in many ways was a photograph I had taken of Bill Agee and Mary Cunningham, not knowing <laughs> who they were at the time because it was at the Republican convention in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And I was photographing Elizabeth Taylor and Frank Sinatra and President Ford and Mrs. Ford, but they were seated next to William Agee and Mary Cunningham. And then a news story happened where they were very prominent for a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I had, at that time, a photograph of the two of them together and, and it appeared all over the world and actually in Newsweek's pictorial review of 1980, but it's no longer an important photograph. You know, it just at that time. It was the it, moment in time. Though. It was just a moment. But, you know, the other photographs that have meant a lot to me, you know, meeting the people that have really touched my own career. Mm -hmm. uh, we had talked casually about Barbara Walters. Well, I attempted to get an interview with Barbara Walters when I was at the Detroit News and I would write her every single month, a handwritten letter. Oh my letter. gosh, you're like, it's me again. <laughs> yes. Every month I would send a letter and she wasn't doing local news stories. She was doing cover stories. Right. So I didn't give up. I thought, I'm going to be like Barbara. I'm going to, I'm not giving up. And she finally said yes. So that story meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. But again, it was the PS to it. After the story was published, she sent me a note and her words changed my life because she said, I hope for our paths to continue to cross in the future and I wish you every success. And Christy, I read that mm. and I said, I'm gonna make that come true. I want my path to cross again with Barbara Walters and it did. So sometimes someone can tell you something mm. and it changes your life forever. The power of words. One line in that letter. And recently I, I did a story for the free press about handwritten letters and the words that you share in a handwritten letter. Lost art. It is a lost art. Yeah. And how those words can change you forever because they're always in your heart. Mm -hmm. And they stay with you. And um, I have words from my father who passed away at a young age that will never leave my heart. I don't have them on video because he died many years ago, but I have his letters. And when I read his letters, he's right here with me again. Yeah. I love the story of, of knocking down the door for Barbara Walters mm -hmm. and not stopping. And right. then, um, do you believe in a lot of either fate or karma or things that then lead you to the other things, to lead you to the other things in terms of everyone that you've been able to come into contact with? You know, Christy, I believe in hard work. I work just as hard today as I did when I first started. Freelancing for the Birmingham Eccentric and then mm -hmm. working at the Detroit News in the 80s. I don't think you ever stop working on a certain level. And mm -hmm. once you do, that's when you lose it. <laughs> that's, well, that's when you're done, right? You're done. Yeah. So the passion I have and the ethic I have has never changed. I, I give it my all. Yeah. And with every photograph and with every, with, you know, whatever it might be, working with children, it's 100% or maybe more. And um, you never coast because once you coast, you know, you, it's obvious to it's, the people that it gets you're sloppy, working. I think it, it, it kind of gets a little sloppy. It does. And some people feel they can, mm -hmm. you know, they get to a certain level and mm -hmm. you feel, well, I don't have to work on that level, but yes, you do. So I, I believe, you know, never, ever not giving your all or, and 
and having that passion and, and love and, and photography for me, you know, is always exciting because there's always something special to capture. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between seeing and looking and photography teaches you to really see life. Explain that to us. Well, it's the detail. Like when I photographed Aretha for what became the cover of my book, but it was her masquerade ball. But when I asked her, Aretha, just stand in your hallway and just turn to the side. And she was dressed as Queen Nefertiti. Mm -hmm. And with the statement earrings and the turquoise nails, she was really ahead of her time. And, but it was just looking at her and having her just think about, you know, the view that she was looking at. And that's what she had this gorgeous home and she was looking outside and, and you can almost see it in her eyes, you know, that beauty that she was looking at. And um, I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. You know, people always say to me, Aretha was, was so private. Mm -hmm. How did you ever have this kind of access to her? Mm -hmm. And you know, Christy, there were two reasons that I feel became the key and one one thing that you know you i guess you learn when you look at people closely her family meant everything mm -hmm. and i watched her very closely with her family so i never said aretha let me just photograph you i always photographed her with her sister and with her cousin and with her brother so she would smile because so many times you, you see photographers and they're shouting for celebrities and they right. completely ignore the family. But I treated her family with as much respect as I had given to her. Mm -hmm. And that was the key to our relationship. So when I look at all my negatives, you know, I didn't take a lot. You know, I mm -hmm. would give her her privacy. But there were always photographs of her sisters and her brother and her cousin. And, and she really enjoyed that. And yeah. it, she was so fabulous. Well, it must know, have been a comfort be to... factor. And I think yes, that's what you, that, you, that you tap into yes. about when you come to someone and you're yeah. there to capture them in the most intimate of ways. And sometimes mm -hmm. when I look at, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these photographs, mm -hmm. um, what is that feeling of trying to connect a little bit, just even a little bit before? Well, you know, that's the whole goal is that connection, just like the way we're connected. Yeah. It's, it's sort of the Barbara Walters school where you know more about the person than they know about themselves. <laughs> okay. So it's really doing your homework. Mm -hmm. It's understanding who that person is. So whenever I go into any shoot or any story that I might be doing, I have read everything there is to read on that person. Mm -hmm. And so with, with Aretha, yes, family, knowing the love she had for her family and it it was just something very natural. And I loved her family too. So it yeah. was just real, you know, to be able to capture them because they were fabulous. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just that sensitivity. Some people have it and some people don't, you mm -hmm. know, and that's, I think that's really what sets us all apart mm -hmm. is a level of sensitivity and caring and compassion and not to be afraid to show it as mm -hmm. journalists, show who you are, show your heart. I think, it, I think it's very important to your audience to people viewing a photograph, you know, well, it connects you. It connects you it connects a whole you. lot more. Yeah, um, when you, when you do. Someone once said to me, you know, I can almost see you in your photographs, and I said, tell me, what does that mean? And and they said because the photographs really do express heart, and that's what it's all about. It's it's all about capturing the heart of someone. I think and, what has also been so um, lovely about your career is that you've developed personal relationships though with yeah. some of these people, especially <laughs> I think, and I, yeah. And I think about Tony Bennett. Yes. You know, Christy, it was um, something that I'll always cherish. Uh, it's, I was so lucky. He was so fabulous. And when was the first time that you photographed him? He was in a restaurant in LA and I went up to him <laughs> and I waited Till we had finished and I said, Mr. Bennett, I followed him outside <laughs> in the, <laughs> and in the 70s and I said, may I take your photograph? And he said, yes. 
And so interesting because in the modern times, everyone pulls out a phone. They don't care about oh, permission. They don't care about anything. No one has any permission anymore with their cell phones. <laughs> uh, but he, I had my camera and like one of Justin's cameras. And so it, recently I was in L.A. and I walked by the wall where I had taken that photo of Tony. And it, it was a little teary because that's the first time. Mm -hmm. And then I did a story about him for the Detroit News where I had I asked him, I said, can I just photograph you? in the seats of Meadowbrook, not on mm -hmm. stage. And he said, yes. So that was an early photo. But we became friendly when I did a story about his art. He's a mm. marvelous artist. And I did a story for Good Morning America on just his painting. I went to his home and I photographed him talking about his art. And I was able to photograph many of his paintings and they were wonderful. And I could look at the memorabilia that was important to him, a letter from Frank Sinatra, a photograph with his mother, photo paintings mm -hmm. of his children. And I could really understand him by going to his home. And mm -hmm. he, was, he was so down to earth and so kind. I watched him many times in restaurants and people would come over and ask for autographs and he never ever was too busy. He would stop mm -hmm. and talk and thank people and here he's, a, an icon, but which he treated everyone with respect and he had heart. Yeah. Uh, it was fun because he would call me when he would come to Detroit and he would say, where can I paint? And I would drop him off in the morning. <laughs> and I didn't tell the people, Chrissy, you would not believe it. I mean, I didn't know these people very well, but I knew they had beautiful gardens. Right. And that's what he loved to paint. He, he described it as painting with nature. And you would drop Tony Bennett in people's gardens. At your house, let's say. <laughs> so if you have a beautiful garden, I, I would call you in the morning. And this is what I said. I said, I'm coming over with Tony Bennett. What? But I thought if I had called the night before. It would have been a totally different thing. The neighborhood would be there. All their friends, family. So this way they had no time to think. And they just said yes. And I would drop him off. And I didn't hover. Mm -hmm. I would maybe take one photograph and then one when he was finished mm -hmm. <laughs> with the painting and with the people that uh, were yeah. so great. And they didn't hover either. They gave him his privacy. And when he passed away, I did a story for the Free Press about those experiences because people didn't know mm -hmm. that when he traveled, he would always paint during mm -hmm. the day and he would travel with his watercolors and with a paper and he was just as devoted to his art as he was to his music and said that was the key to a lasting career having two things that he loved because I asked him for my book the key I said you've got to tell me what is the secret what is that key he said doing two things you love you mm -hmm. never get burned out so you know he would paint during the day and perform at night and he said one is very public and one is very private so when I get burned out of singing, I go to my painting where mm -hmm. I'm just painting with nature. When you look at some of these pictures and I, you know, everyone from Paul Newman to Beyonce that's over your shoulder. The Paul Newman story is funny too. That's, well, you've got to tell me the Paul Newman story. If, 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 that, if that particular one. Yeah. So tell me, what is it? What's well, the Paul Newman story? You get a kick out of this because you, you know, you would know. When the Grand Prix first started in Detroit, they run it through downtown. I mean, yes. It's all Formula One. People from around the and world Paul came here. And was yes, here it was the first year. Mm -hmm. So I was working for the news and they said, somebody's got to get a photo of Paul Newman. So I said, well, <laughs> I'm going to try. And I was down there all day, you know, right around Kobo. And all of a sudden I see him, you know, wearing the tattered denim Wrangler shirt. Mm -hmm snap buttons, the great sunglasses, great, you know, khaki pants. And I thought, oh my God, he's walking towards me. So I said to him, I said, Mr. Newman, I'm a columnist with the Detroit News. May I take your photograph? And he looked at me, he said, sure. And I did. And I said, by the way, um, thank you for coming to Detroit. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. He said, well, it's great to be here. May I ask you one more question? And he, and he said, yes. I said, would you take your sunglasses off? And without <laughs> skipping a beat, he said, I can't. My pants will fall down. <laughs> and I looked.
looked at, and that, that was, I guess, his standard response to that question that I'm sure he was asked all the time. But it was great. So that was taken right underneath Cobo Hall in the yeah. back. It was, it was called the Atwater Cafe at that time. And it was front page because I was the, you know, able yeah, to get the photo. It. But yeah. I, but I didn't give up. You know, that was my goal. <laughs> I made it happen. <laughs> How do you think, uh, Linda, we view celebrity these days? Is it different? I mean, you've been a celebrity photographer for a long time I think it is now. different because, for example, with my book on Aretha, I mm -hmm. had a very smart, young student, a journalism student, say something to me that really resonated. She said, you know, a book like yours could never happen again. I said, explain that. She says, because today, if it's Beyonce or Taylor Swift, everything's been on Instagram. It's, it's over already. It's done. Yeah. They put it out there. Everybody with a cell phone has already put it out there in their social media. So a book like yours, there would be no exclusivity. There would be no interest. And it, as you mentioned, it's done. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. I mean, and, you know, today it is so different. And, and the sad thing that I see happening is that with some young people, if you do ask them, do you know Robert Redford? Mm -hmm. Do you know Paul Newman? They don't. Right. They're not on Instagram. They're not, you know, following them. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge difference today. You know, as, as a kid, you know, I knew Cary Grant right. <laughs> and loved him. And I knew older stars and loved them. But today it's different. What do you think of Instagram and social media and how well, everyone, everyone is a photographer in yeah. their mind with their iPhones? Some are really good. Some are really good. <laughs> Filters can make things really good. Yeah. You know, I think that um, I am on Instagram, but not with, not with a large presence. Maybe mm -hmm. I should be. I am on Facebook more. I think that's more maybe for... Uh, folks my age, <laughs> the Facebook seems to attract more people <laughs> my age. But the Instagram, yeah, it's important for your career. I, I, I don't know about this, the influence of it, you know, mm -hmm. that where it's bought and paid for, you know, that kind of thing. Because as a journalist, um, you know, and I, and I don't believe in altering, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, so that, I guess, leads me to the next question. Is there any such thing as a natural photo anymore? I or an, or a, a totally off-the-cuff photo of a celebrity. It's rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we see them, you know, uh, it, it's rare because then you still don't know. You know, it was this stage to the practice. Yeah, it was yeah, a so stage. Yeah, so you don't really know. But yeah. I think that, uh, you know, the opportunities that I had, like let's say with Aretha where it was exclusive, where she allowed me to stand next to her on stage during a rehearsal with no makeup mm -hmm. and trusted me. So it's, you know, the trust and everything was so very important. And, I, you know, now, you know, it, it's so different. Um, I never, you know, imagined it to be quite like this, mm -hmm. you know, with things the way they're altered. And uh, when you look at something, has it been created or is it truly the moment? Sometimes we have to think about that. How would you recommend for us to practice our eyes? I feel that you see things that maybe we don't. <laughs> That's so, what a nice compliment. I think to practice your eyes is just looking more closely and just really studying just the way you listen to me and the way you listen to the people you're interview, interviewing, it's when you're photographing them, really look more closely before you take the photograph. Just don't take thousands. Like, you know, when, you, when I was shooting film, you're much more thoughtful. Mm -hmm. You know, every photograph was special, important. Now with digital, you shoot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah. and then delete them all. And that's another problem too, is this deletion. Because so often, we delete and maybe that will become important. When I look at negatives, mm -hmm. what I once thought was not the photograph I wanted to publish or use, I now have changed my mind and said, thank goodness I had negatives where you can't delete, you know, it's right here for me. And Interesting, that is, a, that is a really great point because we only save the ones that are perfect. At the time. At the time. But. 10 years from now or 20 years. And the other problem, Christy, that's really, really an issue is not printing the photographs, just sharing. Mm. Your photographs become your memory. It's your history. If you don't save them in an album, 
And how are you going to remember? I, I'm going to be candid with you to tell you when I was working on my book on Aretha, many of the photographs were taken 40 and 50 years ago. And I thought, I can't believe I was there. I, you know, haven't thought about that. I almost forgot about that. But my photographs brought it right back. Mm -hmm. r right back to when she was at the DSO, right back to when I was able to go to a party at her home. But if you don't print those photographs, what's gonna happen? And they, you know, you, we really don't know, you know, how uh, a digital file, <laughs> you know, will preserve. Right you know, in 30 or 40 years from now. So print them, just don't have the file, just don't have a memory card. Actually print the photographs and save them. Becomes your life. When you look around, mm -hmm. is there one picture or a moment in particular, they're like, I wish I had that over again? Or one that you said, I nailed this exactly. <laughs> Yeah, often. <laughs> We're actually, why didn't I just take a couple of more? <laughs> well, you know, uh, yeah, often that happens. Like with Sinatra, you know, Sinatra was always challenging to photograph because mm -hmm. he wasn't like Tony Bennett. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't have the relationship with the press that Tony always had. So I'll never forget, I flew to New York to photograph Sinatra and he walked in. There were many photographers from all over to capture him. He looked at us and he said, Three, two, one, I'm out of here. Oh, my gosh. You're like, well, now we got it. It's not digital, it's film. Right. So you could really get three shots mm -hmm. and he's done. And he walked out. And I said, oh, my God. He left. I flew to New York. I'm on assignment. I had three seconds. <laughs> and he's done. So, yeah. I mean, sometimes you think, oh, gee, if only I'd had more time. But then it was interesting. You know, with Sinatra, I went back and to photograph him for his 80th birthday. And uh, he wasn't well, mm. and he was actually a lot more accessible. But then I thought, wow, it's not really Sinatra because he was so challenging. <laughs> so, but I, I was one of two photographers that photographed him for his 80th. Uh, but yeah, so sometimes you think, gee, if only I had had even even with a Redford or yeah, if only you have a few more a few more minutes to just kind of take that next shot. Yeah, uh, what would you do differently? Yeah, <laughs> and we've all felt that way. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's and it's fun to think about it too. But I'm yeah. I'm always so grateful. You know, this year was really hard for me because three of my favorites passed on this year, uh, and that it was it's been very hard mm. uh, and sad because I won't be able to photograph them again. And and uh, we became friendly. So it was hard. It started with Barbara in December, mm -hmm. Barbara Walters, and then Bert Bacharach I was very close to. And he died in February and then Tony. And so, uh, you know, Bert had said in my in the foreword to my book on Aretha, he wanted Aretha to live forever. and And that's the way I felt about them. Yeah. So, you know, I was just so lucky. They're icons, mm -hmm. you know, so to be able to meet them and get to know them and photograph them, not just once, but many, many times and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm forever grateful. I think mm. what I also love about what you have done is you've really taken an effort to pass on your eye and oh. the gift of photography to younger people and especially those who might not have the access with the pictures mm -hmm. of hope. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to meet some of the most wonderful kids. I work with children experiencing homelessness. And I've been to many cities, to shelters, where I can talk to children and ask them to share their innermost hopes and dreams for a better mm -hmm. life. And then we surprise them with cameras and they go off as journalists. Christy, you would love it because they're on their first assignment, but it's to capture their dreams. Wow. So it's, it's really important for me to show these kids, your dreams matter, mm -hmm. your dreams are important. And the mothers have said, you know, we never had time to sit and say, what are you dreaming about when you close your eyes at night? Because it was always just so, trying to get the next thing done and just exist. To survive. Yeah. So some of the dreams that we've seen are very heartbreaking. 
They're not hoping for video games or dreaming about an iPad or a cell phone or they're dreaming for their own bed. They're dreaming for their mothers to be happy. They're dreaming to, well, this one child said, my dream is for people to not think I'm a nobody. They're just dreaming for people to know they exist that by no fault of their own. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the numbers of homeless children are staggering. At any given time, there are 4.5 million children in the U.S. And mm -hmm. it's hard to really define that number because sometimes a child and his mother or her mother could be living in a relative's home for a month or two. So it's really hard to know the actual numbers, but after the pandemic, the numbers escalated. Um, my goal is to just, as a journalist, create awareness yeah. for these children. And the program, yeah. the program continues to grow. Oh, it does. We've been to 52 cities where I'm, my next city is Tacoma. I've not been there. And actually the mayor of Tacoma asked me to bring pictures of hope. Mm. Uh, to her children in her city. That's a really great thing. Our mentors have been really prominent mentors in every city, mayors, the police chief. It's so special for these kids to realize their heroes respect them and want to help them. So for the police chief and the fire chief <laughs> to come to a shelter and share their dreams together and they go off together on their assignment. So I loved it. I've been doing this since 2005. And mm. one of the most uh, poignant experiences happened here. There was a little boy I met who lived in the Salvation Army with his mother. And we asked him, what are you dreaming about? And he was able, he had the courage to walk in front of our tutorial. And he said, I just have two dreams. My first dream is to see my mother smile again. And my other dream is to have my own bed. And Christy, what I've learned by going to shelters, there aren't hmm. enough beds. The kids are sleeping on the floor or they're sleeping on an air mattress. So the dream for a bed is one of the dreams I see most often. And after he said that, just like Justin, mm. the videographer who was capturing it, it might've been for WDIV, mm. said, I'm gonna, I wanna g give this child a bed. Yeah. And he did. And when he was on TV locally, and the power of what you do and how it changes child's life is evident in what happened here. He, he shared those dreams and one of the Detroit Lions was watching yeah. and said, I want to help that little boy who wants to see his mother smile. Yeah. So he called the Salvation Army. It was the, the Detroit Lion is Dre Bly, mm -hmm. yeah. former Detroit Lion. Yeah. He said, how can I help? And they actually connected them. He was on the phone and he said, I want to get you your bed. He said, oh, it was already <laughs> given to me by the videographer. And he said, well, what else can I do for you? It's so special that you want to see your mother happy. Yeah. So he said, well, we were able to move into a little apartment and we don't have a stove. And Dre Bly, one now. <laughs> he said, you're going to have one. And he said, and is there anything else you're dreaming about? He said, yeah. We don't have a refrigerator. He said, I'm going to get you that too. Oh. And then he said, Dre Bly said to Darius, it's Christmas time. You haven't said anything about what you're dreaming about just for you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like just for you? And he said, yes. I would like to have a lamp because I have to do my homework with a flashlight. And no toys, nothing. Nothing. Just that. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Dre Bly did that for him. Yeah. But Christy, these children are expressing life lessons for all of us. Mm -hmm. They just want and dream for the things that truly matter. I love that you get to experience that with them. So let me ask it's you. It's changed my life. What do you What do you dream? What do I dream? I just I dream for my mother who lives with me. I love her <laughs> to be happy and healthy forever. Yeah. <laughs> just like Darius, I want my mother to be happy and healthy forever. I'm so grateful to have her. Yeah. L losing my dad, it's you know at a young age, and um, and. You know, we want health and happiness mm -hmm. for our families, for our friends. That's what's most important for my career, um, to be able to continue to meet the children that I have met and give them the chance to share their dreams. And is there a celebrity that you have not photographed that you want to? <laughs> you're going to laugh. <laughs> I met her once, but she is my dream celebrity. I know you're going to say, gosh, wow, does she know that? Uh, it's Nancy Myers. Now she's a director and a writer, but she's directed and written my favorite movies. <laughs> and during COVID, I would watch her movies over and over and over again, The Parent Trap. Something's got to give. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. The holiday. And they brought such happiness to me. During COVID, I was so stressed, as we all are, and watching a Nancy Myers movie. Well, Linda, I think you can start writing the letter. Yeah, I need to say her in the letter. I've got to. That's because it's my dream to just yeah. talk to her and thank her for giving me so much happiness. Mm. But yeah, I I I really appreciate it. Well, talking to you. Thanks thank for you. bringing us happiness. Thanks for bringing thank us you. joy through um, through thank capturing you. thanks other people and letting us see as deeply as you did in that moment. Oh, so thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for the time, Linda. This was great. Thanks, Christy. Mm -hmm.